Jeffy does his own vlogs. That's a video blog. Um, but he did one of our floats getting ready, and I was just so impressed. So where, where is Preston? Oh, he's right there hiding. So he did this. We're going to share this and open up service today and just... And I'm impressed to see what God's going to do in and through this. That could be a very awesome ministry. Next year, if you want to be a part of the fun, 
just come out and join us. We'll have all that stuff posted. It's a really good time, um, and we always have a blast. It's a fun team that, that puts the, the float together and goes out and marches through town. And so if you want to be part of that, you will have an opportunity. Uh, if you want to stand and join us, we are going to get into this service this morning. Um, let's open with a word of prayer. Uh, Father God, we just thank you so much. Uh, for the many blessings that you that you give us. God, we thank you for the gifts of the people in this church, in our church family, um, that use it, God, to, to glorify you. Um, God, help us all to realize the things that you've um, blessed us with, the gifts that you've given us, so that we can uh, better serve you um, and make a difference in our community for your name's sake. God, we love you so much. We pray this all in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. <laughs>
James a couple weeks ago, and the first sermon was about how broken we are. For the longest time, I would always think that the phrase broken just meant like a few cracks. But the preacher, Stephen, had a glass shrek cup. Not mentioning that it was free from McDonald's, it was worthless already. He used that cup re- to represent us, and when he chucked it on the ground, it shattered. The shards of glass were incredibly small. People wanted that cup and would pay like 20 bucks to get that cup. Even when it was shattered, people wanted it enough that they would pay for it. God didn't have to create us, but he wanted a relationship with us. And just like the cup had a job, our job was to glorify God. But then we sinned and shattered just like that cup. God still wanted us even if we were worthless and unable to do our jobs. Just like that cup should go in the trash, we should have died. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. But God didn't stop winning us, so he sent his son to put that cup that was in thousands of pieces back together. He went through the long process and endured the pain to restore us. When he was finished, he had fixed fixed us and healed us. And just like those crazy people who wanted to still pay for the fragmented glass cup, God wanted something that couldn't do its job and was dedicated to fix it so it could do its job. Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus loved us enough to fix something that was absolutely shattered on the ground. And honestly, I want to know how many people would fix their favorite coffee cups if it were were to break in several pieces, let alone shatter, instead of buying a new one. That is a love that God only knows. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you put forth the effort and pain and time to put us back together. Amen.
Hello again, everyone. Um, we have a special ju- or, yeah, junior church thing today. So four years through fourth grade, you are dismissed to walk. Typically, we don't have junior church on the fifth Sunday, but Dustin, it's the Summer Bash Junior Church. I don't know what that means, but I'm not in junior church, so... So, also, um, I didn't mention this last week. I kind of forgot, actually. Uh, You've seen our kids are doing a lot. We just had Preston come up, and he did the video, and then he did a great meditation. Our kids are getting so active in different things as they grow. Um, We we did want to mention that at high school week at camp, Sydney Helbert was baptized. She's not here this week, but so was Emmy Lambertson. And so... And along with that, we have a new members family, Um, Ryan Kelly, Aubrey, Emmy, Lexi, and little David. uh, They've officially joined us as members of this family here, so that's exciting. It is great. I I just love seeing our youth doing things. I, I really do. That is just, I love that. Speaking of kids, though, um... Have you ever taken your kid to a restaurant, you know, you buy them food? Well, this boy, five-year-old boy, wanted to go to McDonald's and get French fries. His dad knew how much he loved it, so he said, sure, let's go have a snack. When they got to the counter, the dad told him, supersize. Now, you know this five-year-old, he is thrilled. He's going to get supersized fries. They sat down, and here is this big a container full of fries. He is so excited about it. The dad reached over and took one, and the little boy got upset. He reached to take a second one, and the boy put his hands around it, and he said, these are mine, not yours. Now, just think for a moment. Who suggested to go get the fries? Dad did. That's right. Whose car did they drive, and who paid for the gas? The dad did, okay? Who offered to supersize them? Who paid for them? Who ultimately is the owner of these french fries? The dad is. Now, he did give them to his son, but I wonder if that's how God feels sometimes about us. Is it a similar attitude and action that we display towards God? Who has supplied all of our gifts and talents? Who has supplied all of our resources? Who has supplied everything we need? And yet, so many times do we act like this little five-year-old, saying, that's mine, I own this. What is one topic that people hate to hear in church? Giving, money, Well, here at St. Joe, we will always and only preach what is found in Scripture. If the Bible talks about giving, that's what we're going to preach and teach, which leads us back to 1 Chronicles chapter 29. We're all looking through the life of David, you know, so what is this? This event in David's life is one of his spiritual highlights. And I wish, I really wish this was the last thing we knew of David, because that would leave on a pinnacle. Unfortunately, in the next few weeks, we're going to see how David's story, his life, ends. We did look at this passage once before, and when we looked at it a few weeks ago, it was talking about what kind of a legacy are you leaving. Uh, some of the things we looked at were, how can we inspire our kids to have a real faith in God? We must start with ourselves. we got to get rid of religion and into a right relationship with God. And then put our own faith into practice. We need to do these things. But there's more in this passage that I think we really need to address. So, 1 Chronicles 29, starting in verse 3. And now, because of my devotion to the temple of my God, I am giving all of my own private treasures of gold and silver to help in the construction. This is an addition to the building materials I've already collected for His holy temple. I am donating more than 112 tons of gold from Ophir and 262 tons of refined silver 
to be used for overlaying the walls of the buildings and for the other gold and silver work to be done by the craftsmen. Now then, who will follow my example and give offerings to the Lord today? David is up front about his offerings for God. I always thought that when you gave your offering, you didn't tell anybody. I, the widow's might. She just put in two little coins. She didn't say much about it. And the other guys were, oh, making sure they dropped the coins so everybody could hear it. But David here is being transparent in his devotion to God to help build the temple that's for God. And he's a man after God's own heart, so we need to see why is this a good trait. David did all this because he loved God so much. He was so grateful for all God had done for him. And David did it all, not in secret, but openly. To demonstrate to the people the depths of his devotion to God. Not only did David openly declare without fanfare exactly what he's giving to God for this temple project, he was not trying to be sensational here. He was being honest, and he is trying to set an example. That's here. He is not saying, hey, I want you all to give, and just know I gave some too. He is saying, I gave this much. Who will join me? Just look at the gifts that he gave. It's staggering. In addition to the bronze, iron, uh, wood, onyx, marble, turquoise, and other precious stones, David gave 3,000 talents. That's 112 tons of gold. 220,000 pounds. He gave 7,000 talents of silver, which is 262 tons. 262 tons of silver. And remember... David didn't have to give. This was all of his private stash. He didn't have to give this much. He could have held it on to it for himself or his enormous family, but he didn't. Instead, he gladly, joyfully, and transparently gave it all to the Lord. He didn't wait for accolades. That, that's one of my favorite things here. He said how much he's giving, and then he said this phrase, Now then, who will follow my example and give offerings to the Lord today? Who will join me? Who will take up the mantle? Who will come and be a part of this offering? Well, let's see what happens. Sorry, verse 6. Then the family leaders, the leaders of the tribes of Israel, the generals, the captains of the army, the king's administrative officers, all gave willingly. For the construction of the temple of God, they gave about 188 tons of gold, 10,000 gold coins, 375 tons of silver, 675 tons of bronze, and 3,750 tons of iron. They also contributed numerous stones, precious stones, which were deposited in the treasury in the house of the Lord under the care of Jael, the descendant of Gershom. The people rejoiced over the offering, for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord, and King David was filled with joy. David's challenging question here, who will join me, is met with an electrifying response. In wild enthusiasm and joy, the leaders of every level of the nation stepped forward and gave generously. This compelling desire to do something magnificent for the Lord swept across the crowd, and it gave even more proceeds for this project. The value of this project, in today's terms, would be multiple billions of dollars. That's an incredibly generous group of people, but consider this. They had that much to give. They had that much to give. I got to see something similar to this firsthand last year at our week of camp. We were trying to raise money. If you remember, we had um, Thomas Kim. Uh, he came and spoke here that one time. We were trying to raise around $2,000, and if they did, I was going to, you know, Matt Love was going to shave his beard, and there was something else I can't remember. Oh, yeah, you guys got to throw water balloons at me, like everybody in the camp. It, it's, a, it's a camp stoning where they hit me. That's right. I wanted to forget that. Well, 102, I think, campers, on, on Thursday night, we had about... $1,000. And I was like, you have one night. 
There's no way you're going to meet this goal. I am going to stay dry. I was excited. And while I was saying that and saying that, a, a girl came up and dropped 20 bucks on the stage. I'm like, okay, so we're 20 bucks. And then they all just started coming. And that night they raised over a thousand more dollars. They had all that money with them the whole time. But here's the cool thing. They all came willingly, generously, transparently, and brought it up, and we were overwhelmed with joy to see that happen. God had blessed this youth to do this. He God had blessed the people of, of David's time richly. They, they had that much to give. Now, with that, that comes something that tells us something. God doesn't expect us to give what we don't have. But he does expect us to give according to what we do have. If you don't have it, God's not going to say, give it to me. You don't have it. But what we do have, he expects to give according to that. And after these people gave for the temple, after that youth gave for the, the missions, there was ecstatic joy among the people. Their enthusiasm in their giving, the glad abandonment of their savings and wealth, to God was all done with cheerful spontaneity. Spontaneity. The giving of these leaders caused all the people to rejoice, and then it ended that even King David was filled with joy. And I have to believe that made the very gates of heaven reverberate with joy when people gave in faith and in joy. Do you know why I say that heaven would be filled over joy of a big offering? Because God loves a cheerful, joyous, hearty giver. Not just heaven is filled, but David. It said David was filled. Verse 10. Then David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly. So right there in the midst of all this offering that came up, David says, O oh Lord, the God of our ancestor Israel, may you be praised forever and ever. Yours, O oh Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and and the majesty. Everything in the heavens and on earth is yours. All this stuff we gave was already yours right there. Oh Lord, and this is your kingdom. We adore you as the one who is over all things. Wealth and honor come from you alone, for you rule over everything. Power and might are in your hand, and at your discretion, people are made great and given strength. Oh, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. He didn't say, God, this is how much we gave to you. God, look what we have done for your name. He gave God the credit. David Grass, as few people do, that God is not only God, but he is truly exalted in all of his greatness. David understood that everything is God's, and everything comes from God. With great humility here, David realized that he was in the position he was in because of God, because of God's graciousness. And for that reason and so many others, David had overflowing joy, thankfulness, and praise. After this little song of praise, he continued his prayer of recognition that everything comes from God. And then he prayed that God would keep the desires of the hearts of his people always loyal towards God. This is a great example of giving in faith, devotion to God, and an action of faith. Unfortunately, there are some thoughts that are very destructive to our faith. We hate hearing and talking about money. And it could it be because, well, secretly we need more. We think we need more. We've got to have more. We've got to do this. And our thoughts, our improper thoughts or misguided thoughts have given us some myths about giving. Here's three quick myths. My money and possessions belong to me. That's mine, like those French fries. That's a myth. Number two, I can't afford to give. I've actually said that before. I can't afford to give that much. I just, that's a myth. And number three, my attitude and actions about money and giving have no relationship to my spiritual life. What I give in tithe has no bearings on my faith. That's a myth. 
Those are justifications we try to say so that we don't have to feel guilty. But those myths are completely false. These myths rob us of real faith, which strip us of joy. Today's text and the rest of the Bible makes it clear that scriptures we read today are proof that giving is part of our faith. So what is the truth we must follow first? We learn who is the source of all we have. God is the source. First Chronicles 29, David clearly and correctly declares, God is the owner and the source of all things. And do you know the rest of the Bible agrees with that? Deuteronomy 8, 17 and 18. You may say to yourself, your power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore with your ancestors as it is today. You can say, well, I built this house. I made this stuff. I put my own work. Well, who gave you that strength? Who gave you that ability? That's all comes from God. In the New Testament, James chapter 1, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. Anything that is a gift to you, anything that is around you, if it is good, guess what? God gave it to you. 1 Corinthians 4, 7. For what gives you the right to make such a judgment? What do you have that God hasn't given you? And everything you have is from God. Why boast as though it were not a gift? I, uh, I have this weird ability to get in front of people and speak. Like, this doesn't scare me. This, this is fun. I enjoy this. I mean, I've waited all week to do this again. This isn't natural. So how did I get this? Did, did I go to, I went to college, so I learned to be a good preacher and speaker, and so I did it through all my hard work. No. This is only a gift. I'm not up here because I am good. I'm up here because God is good, and he gave me a gift. He gave Preston a gift. You saw that video? The editing on that just blew me away. I'm like, man, he's going to be making more videos for the church. Oh, by the way, will you make more videos for the church? Okay. You heard some of our teens and our youth doing things, service projects, singing, the gifts they do. I would love to say all my kids got all their gifts and talents from me. But you know that's not true. They got it from God. Everything we have comes from God. And it is critical we understand that what we have is not ours. It belongs to God. This critical shift in our minds from owner to manager makes all the difference in the world. It should cause us to loosen our grip on things we, as we realize God has just loaned these things to us, put us in charge for them. What we spend on ourselves is God's, and what we give to God is His to begin with. So when we say, I can't afford to give, what we're really saying is God doesn't own anything. So we need to realize that. Second thing we learn about giving is a sign of our commitment and devotion to God. We always spend our money on what is most important to us. Our treasure is where our money is. Our money is where our treasure is. They go hand in hand. Whatever is our greatest interest and delight is where we will spend our money. If you find joy in God, then that's and what he is doing, then you're going to give generously to the work of the Lord. If our financial giving to the Lord is not what it could or should be, then maybe it's a sign that our commitment just isn't where we think it should be or where God thinks it should be. I do not know how much anyone gives in the church except Casey and I. I don't want to know what anyone gives, okay? I, that is not my job. I'm not going to sit there and look. But I do want to confess something, okay? I have noticed at times when, you know, I'm talking with people up front or in the back there, I'll notice some people don't put anything in the offering. There were times when I would help pass offering plates before COVID when we could actually do that type of thing. And I would notice people would just pass the offering plate. They didn't put anything in. And 
And I always wondered, what does that mean? I'm not trying to make a negative judgment. That's not what I'm saying. Because I, I thought it could mean that maybe you didn't get paid this week. There are people who don't get paid every week, and so they don't give money on the weeks they don't get paid. Perhaps they get paid every other week, once a month, and that's when they give. But then that thought would always trigger, maybe it means they just don't give. Could it mean that they don't like the church? And this is where my brain goes. Did I do something that made them upset so they don't want to give? Is, is it my fault? Am I hindering something? Every person, young or old, who has some kind of income, according to Scripture, has a responsibility to return some of that to the Lord as a sign of their obedience, commitment, and desire to see God glorified. God's principle is that our giving is in proportion to our income. That's why giving in a percentage makes sense. If God increases or de- increases or decreases my income, that means my tithe can increase or decrease accordingly. Our giving is also an indication to God about where our heart is. When my kids needed something, guess what I, I did? I got it for them because I love it. When my kids wanted something, well, depends on if I wanted it too. But when I they needed something, I'd make sure it happened. Believers who have consecrated, who have devoted their lives to God, are always and inevitably generous givers. A person can't be a fully dedicated Christian and hear this, okay? A person can't be a fully dedicated to Christ and hate to give. I didn't come up with that line. I read that in, a, in an article. If a person truly loves God with all their heart, then they will give. They won't be able to help themselves, this guy actually said. Because where their heart is, their treasure will go or go there also. So this makes me wonder, where, where is my heart at times when it comes to funding, when it comes to finances? And here's why we hold on to it. We think this money is going to make us happy. It's going to help us. But the third thing we learned from David is real joy comes from generous giving. Real joy comes from God. David and his people rejoiced greatly after they'd given willingly and generously. You should have seen the chapel up at the camp erupt in cheers when we started counting the money in front of all of them, and they gave over $1,000 in one night. These kids who didn't want to give, okay, that's why they didn't give. All of a sudden, we're spurred on by this one girl who came and dropped some money, and then another one who did it, and then they cascadingly, enthusiastically, poured out offerings and blew our minds, which caused all of us to be joyful. They were all filled with real joy, and we, we wanted to start singing more songs. It stirred within us a sense of worship. We will never know all the joy possible until we begin giving to God as we can and as we should. Because God is a God who loves to give. God loves to pour out and give of himself to us. How many of you are awake and alive? Okay, I, I was just going to do a live, but I wanted to see who was awake too. Who is giving you that breath of life? God, okay. One minute. Who here has food at home? Who is giving you that food? Who has even made the food possible? Who has made it possible that you can work to buy some of that food? Who has given you a family? Who has given you resources? Who has given you himself? He gives and he gives. And you and I are made in the image of God. And if he finds joy in giving, we will too. We think by holding on, we're going to hold on to it and get that joy. But every time we hold on, we become bitter and grumpy. When 
we give as He created us to, we experience joy and satisfaction, satisfaction like God does. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive, and we won't experience that blessedness until we do what He says. If we want to know true joy in our lives, then we must start giving generously. And finally, by David, this whole thing, we learn that when we give generously and faithfully, God supplies all that we need. This is a divine principle. Most of us um, know this. Those who sow generously, reach in. Okay, so if you still are awake, good. 2 Corinthians 9 says this, Remember this, the farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. You must decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. This right here, that's, that's for the preacher. Do not give because somebody up here tells you to give. That's what that says. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. That's why you give. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Right there, that verse, you know what he just said? When you give joyfully, God's going to pour so much on you that you can give even more. So that joy can keep coming. Verse 9, as the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good, their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. This whole thing, God is going to supply. I can't afford to give. Then you don't believe in God. You don't trust that He'll provide for you. You want to know, uh, if you want to be known as a generous person in God's eyes, it says God loves a cheerful giver. I want to make sure God loves me. I want to do anything that shows that He loves me. This is where faith comes in, because verse 8 said it, then God will give generously provides all that you need. There's an implication in this. After you cheerfully give, give of your treasure, give of your finances, then God will generously provide all you need. This is, the, this is where it takes that step of faith. It would be so much easier, God, if you would just give me all these riches, then I will give. But that's not faith. It says, when I give generously, then He pours out even more on us. It's about obe obedience in our faith. Malachi 3, the, the number one thing here about giving. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that you, there may be food in my house. And put me to the test in this, says the Lord of armies. If I do not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows... Then I will rebu rebu uh -huh, rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor will the vine of you in your field prove fruitless to you, says the Lord of armies. Do you see what it says? Bring in the tithe, and we already know that it means joyously, generously. Put it in there, and then see how he pours out even more on you. What this really comes down to. This is why money is such a hard task at giving. Because a lot of people, well, Donnie's just asking for a raise. I'm not asking for a raise. I, I'm not. I'm not even due for one for quite a while. Okay? This has nothing to do with my, my money. This has everything to do with my faith and yours. Do you, do I, do we believe in God's promises? Do you believe that if you give generously, God will still take care of you? Do you believe that when you faithfully, actively, joyously give of your resources to God,
that He is going to pour out even more on you? It's a hard question for many people, especially in America. Because while we want to say we worship God, many times we worship this. We want to make sure this is, is full. We've got to make sure this is ready just in case. But God wants us to trust Him. How many of you remember the Pepsi Challenge? Six people, that's it. Okay, so back in the 80s, in the golden time of music and fashion, music and fashion, not the mullets, no, not the mullets, okay, but there was a series of commercials and campaigns that people, they would give this blind taste test between Coke and Pepsi. They put it in a box and, or pour it in a glass and you couldn't tell the difference by look and, and they give them taste and then they'd ask them, which ones do you like? They'd, they'd ask first, which one are you? I'm a Coke drinker. Okay, tell me which one is better. Well, this one is. That's Pepsi. And they kept showing more and more because it's commercial and they only showed the ones they wanted. They believed that if you give Pepsi a try, you would Pepsi would win. Well, do you know God gives us a Pepsi challenge? Except he calls it the giving challenge. God encourages us to test him in this. And I believe if we would just take hold of that promise and pour out our finances to Him, and be, I am not saying give everything in your wallet so that you are completely broke. He says be good stewards, but do it in faith. And I believe if we give faithfully, generously, and sacrificially, the result will be great joy in the supplying of everything we need. If we take hold of this giving, giving challenge, as David asked the people that day, David said this, Who will devote themselves to the Lord? I'm going to ask the same question. Who will devote themselves to God and show it to their giving? See, it's not something I'm going to see. It's not something anyone else is going to see. This is between you and God. And who's here willing? And, and I'm not trying to raise our, our finances. It could be that you want to give and start giving more to a mission so that God's work can start going further in those areas. But who will devote themselves to God and show it through their giving? Because God says He will pour out even more. God will certainly be pleased, and we will all rejoice together as the Lord as we become joyful givers. Who will take up that giving challenge? Because you cannot outgive God. That's the challenge. Try it. Just try it. If, if you're at 10% of giving, I want to challenge you. Just try giving up to 12 or 13. Just up it some and say, God, I want to make it so that I can't make it financially unless you step in. That's how much I believe because you will do it. Because once you put that money down, guess what? It's in his hands again, which is where we want to live. Always in his hands. Let's close with prayer. God, we thank you so much for all the stuff you give us, all the resources, the love, the grace. God, we ask right now that you would help forgive us when we make an idol out of our finances. Forgive us of that. And bring back to mind what our true faith needs to be is in you who gives everything, not in what we think we can do on our own. And Lord, I thank you for this generous church that we are all a part of. I am astounded at how much this church just loves to be generous on so many people and missions. And it is a true testament of, of our faith in you. And I thank you for that gift that you have given this church. And so God, I ask you, will you grow even that in us as well? guide us this week to help us to see any chance we can be generous to other people to, to fulfill your work to further your name. And we thank you for giving everything you have. For giving your very life so that we could be saved through Jesus. In whose name we pray.